currently more than 7 billion people living on planet Earth. Just this year alone, more than 52 million people have been born. By the year 2024, that global population will have grown to 8 billion people. That's a big number and a big strain on the Earth's natural resources. All this, of course, leads to the big question of where all the energy, food and other resources are coming from to satisfy the ever-increasing needs of an ever-increasing population. In our own corner of the globe, Northwest Europe, this problem is particularly acute. This area of the planet is heavily populated, has a lot of heavy industry, and while we may have fossil fuels, we don't want to extract them, because using them is environmentally unfriendly. Challenges in the Northwest Europe region are basically, uh, first of all, the region is a very dense region with a lot, a lot of uh, people living there, a lot of economic and also uh, other activities, transport, you name it, it's all over there. In this same uh, limited space, we also want to create a sort of an, an energy uh, policy and an energy field in which, uh, in which basically renewables will take a big part. That is, I think, one of the biggest challenges for our area. So, demand for energy is increasing. We need to produce secure and sustainable sources of energy, and we need to try and do this without producing pollutants and waste. It's a problem which the politicians of Europe are already looking at, and one which scientists across the region of Northwest Europe are researching. And that includes scientists here at Swansea University. They've been leading a transnational project looking at one possible option to help solve the problem. One of the exciting possible solutions to our dilemma of finding a sustainable energy source can actually be found in abundance around these very shores, and indeed on the shores of Northwest Europe. Algae could hold the key to making our environment more sustainable and greener in more ways than one. So what are algae and how exactly could they help? There are two types of algae. The first of these are the ones we're all familiar with, seaweed, otherwise known as macroalgae. They grow along rocky shores of much of Northwest Europe's coastline and can grow several metres in length. The second type are the related microalgae. They are much, much smaller than macroalgae and are typically single-celled and microscopic. The upper layers of the ocean are teeming with them and they also grow in lakes, ponds and are even found in raindrops. Thousands can fit in a small drop of water. They are nonetheless just as impressive as their larger relatives and all algae are extremely versatile and useful organisms. Algae have been used historically for, for hundreds of years for all sorts of different products. Um, historically they would have been collected and used as fertiliser, um, would have been burned to produce soda ash which was used in the glass industry um, and that would all actually have happened here in Ireland. Um, in other parts of the world algae is a major, major foodstuff um, and most of the algae harvesting and growing that we are sort of currently trying to do here is done in other parts of the world uh, and in Asia on a huge scale um, where the crop is used for food. Um, it's very profitable to use for food and not so much for biofuel as we are currently trying to use it for. Over geological time it was algae that transformed Earth into the planet it is today. If it was not for algae, the Earth's atmosphere would be like that of Venus, full of carbon dioxide. Most oil and gas were also derived from ancient algal biomass. In the main, they just need light and nutrients, including carbon dioxide, nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, and of course water. Notably, the nutrients are often available as waste products from other processes, including sewage treatment and from industry. Algae operate as chemical factories, provide them with enough of the correct resources and they'll turn out all kinds of biofuel and useful chemicals. And their potential is what is so exciting. Algae has the potential to contribute to a sustainable society in so many different ways and through industrial biotechnology processes it can really help improve the environment of everybody, especially in Northwest Europe. It can help clean wastewater, it can help use carbon dioxide, so two major pollutants that we have in abundance in Northwest Europe. We can produce exciting chemical compounds such as um, nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals, products for cosmetics industry, you know, things like that. A quick look at this illustration explains how algae have a contribution to make across the board and how best for algae to make their contribution was the main reason for setting up the Enalgae project. 
The 14 million euro in algae project was funded by the European Union under the Interreg scheme. Between 2011 and 2015, the project partnership, made up of seven countries and 19 partner organisations across Northwest Europe, conducted research into how best to grow, harvest and process algae in order to maximise their potential. To begin with, the partnership established several pilots, focusing on different areas and conducting their own unique experiments. The data and best practice was then shared with other partners and the wider community. This included information on how best to grow algae using different systems, how much algae can be expected to be produced in a particular region, as well as the cost of doing so. I think the Pilot Plant Network has been pivotal in helping provide a lot of the missing answers that we have in, in understanding the potential for algae in Northwest Europe. There's a long way to go, but it really provides a lot of the information that we're lacking in terms of yield, cost, economics, you know, for the Northwest Europe context. I think that NLG was a great opportunity to gather lots of competencies uh, and it was uh, an opportunity for several academics uh, working on the different types of algae, so um, as well seaweeds as microalgae uh, together um, and also to exchange on their methods, on their laboratory, um, on their uh, vision also of algae for energy. The project has also helped build a picture of the legislative framework in place within the partner countries. And it's looked for potential markets for algae and its byproducts. It's a relatively new industry in many respects, so there's a lot uh, of work to be done building up value chains, building up supply chains, understanding some of the fundamental science and then applying that to industrial uh, applications. So we're still really searching out what the full range of opportunities is for the algae industry, but certainly they are numerous. So let's take a closer look at the first of these potential markets, bioenergy. The main product which has attracted the most interest is growing algae for energy. And this was a key reason behind the EU's decision to fund an algae, to determine if algae could be grown and harvested to produce biofuel. The answer, in a nutshell, is yes. And this is how it's done. So, can we produce biofuels from algae? Well, yes we can. The first thing we need is for the cell to be photosynthesizing. When the cell's photosynthesizing, it's producing sugars. This sugar provides the energies for protein, DNA and structural lipid production. However, in order to increase the number of lipids, we need to reduce our nutrients. When we reduce the nutrients, the sugar is redirected to starch and structural fatty acids. But when we reduce our nutrient levels, we also reduce our growth rates. So what we're trying to figure out is how to balance the light, balance the nutrient supply to get a decent growth rate. The problem is that high biofuel production and high growth rate can't occur in the same cell simultaneously. This fuel could then be used to power cars, lorries, aeroplanes and so on. And of course there's energy in the form of food. After all, algae form the base of all the food chains in the ocean, leading to the fish on your plate. You can use seaweed directly in the food, in food, but you can also make uh, or extract components from it that you can use in the food industry, uh, like for instance the alginates that you can uh, use in, uh, in desserts. Um, you can also make food additives from it uh, and you can make uh, feed. Uh, we have a, a very large cattle uh, stock here in West Flanders, so we need a lot of uh, animal feed and I'm sure that we can use products from seaweed and, uh, and animal feed as well. But algae's contribution to energy is not only in the energy it can create, but in the energy it can save through a process known as bioremediation. You'll remember that algae use resources like CO2 to grow. The algae can absorb it from the air and this makes them of great interest to industry. There's an inherent problem within steelmaking. In order to reduce iron oxide to make iron, you have to uh, apply carbon to it. So in order to uh, reduce iron oxide to iron, you inevitably generate carbon dioxide. And it's the only viable method we have at the moment of making new steel from, from iron ore. Um, the projects that we have on the go with Swans University, particularly in Algae and Accomplish, uh, aim to capture this inevitably produced CO2 in order to then uh, capture it or to reuse it so that it has less of an impact on the environment. The, the potential, particularly with an algae and an accomplish, is, is that 
we'll be able to capture the CO2 and potentially by filtering it through algae and using the CO2 as a, as a, um, a media to fertilize algae, we can potentially develop that into a permanent storage solution for the CO2 or to develop it into uh, a usable product. In this example, potentially biodiesel or other fuels which can be used uh, so that it, we, we can maximize the benefit of the CO2 that we inevitably produce at the moment. So our results show then we can um, remediate 25% of total volume of CO2 for the algal cultivation process. This is quite innovative results and we're really uh, confident to confirm that it's, it's working well. As well as removing waste CO2 from industries, algae can also play a big part in cleaning up waste water, whatever that water might contain, be it waste from farming or other human activity. Municipal wastewater, for example, is high in nutrients, as is waste from fish farms. This wastewater can be damaging to the environment, but good for algae. One key set of experiments has been done with fish farms here in Belgium, simply by adding algae to the farm's wastewater. The algae, they produce oxygen, and actually for wastewater treatment, you need oxygen. Normally, the oxygen is put into the reactor by pumps, consuming electricity. So we produce it in situ. And secondly, this oxygen is used by bacteria, and these bacteria uh, treat also the wastewater. So actually, in our reactor, we have a combination of a collaboration of two kinds of species, algae and bacteria, to treat the wastewater and have a clear effluent. In Belgium, farmers keep an open mind to sustainable energy sources and are readily embracing renewables. Farmers are actually uh, working more and more in renewable energy. We see more and more uh, uh, photovoltaic installations, uh, uh, solar panels on the roofs of uh, uh, stables and, and hangars and, and things like that. Uh, more and more also in uh, cattle, uh, cattle breeders are implementing uh, biogas, uh, small scale biogas installations. What I see that we miss in the LG field is the links between uh, the companies. So we, we have often the problem that um, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of companies have the idea to do something with the waste streams or they see that they, they have a phosphate or nitrate uh, uh, rich uh, water. So they, they know they can do something with it, but they miss the expertise and the, the, the people to, to help them uh, start things up. Enalgi has stepped up to help provide this link with companies, like Alpro, for example. Alpro is a global company which produces plant-based products and has a production facility in Belgium. The company readily embraces renewable energy and sustainability and has been using algae in its wastewater for several years with much success. Alpro embraces the idea of renewable energy and um, of course we find it important. Why? Alpro is a, a green um, company um, at, at itself, so the product that we make is, is green. So um, soy products uh, are far more better uh, at the, um, environment, for the environment than, for instance, products uh, who are based on animals. So yes, Alpro believes in renewable energy. How do we do that? Um, for instance, we have a wastewater treatment plant and the first step of our wastewater treatment plant is an anaerobic reactor which produces biogas. Uh, it's about 60 to the 100 cubic uh, meters per hour um, and that biogas is used to power uh, a CHP, a combined heat and power. It runs on uh, natural gas and, is, um, and also runs a bit on our uh, biogas. So what we do, we make electricity of it and we use the heat uh, in, a, in a way that we uh, can use all the heat in our company. But efforts don't stop there. Enalgi scientists from Ugent campus in Kortrijk, Belgium, have also been using algae to clear phosphorus from the wastewater too. Scientists there have been working on algal bacterial communities, so-called MAB flocculants. What we are trying to do is see if we can make this wastewater even better by getting all of the phosphorus out of it. So we're actually focusing on phosphorus polishing because we want to reach an even better effluent quality. And then that water will be discharged in the river Leie and we will also have a map flock biomass, a microalgal bacterial flock biomass, which contains a lot of phosphorus. At the moment, the EU allows for two milligrams of phosphorus per litre of wastewater. But there is speculation this could be reduced even further to just one milligram. If that happens, the work being carried out here 
will be of major significance to companies like Alpro. In that case, uh, the algae project could help us to, do, um, to, uh, to achieve that new limit. If we could install an algae reactor behind our installation to polish up our effluent, maybe it would be possible uh, to achieve that limit without doing very big uh, investments. And in the wonderfully cyclical nature of growing algae, the phosphorus, which is collected as waste from this company's water, is actually a valuable product to others. In fact, the biomass produced from the growth of these algae is a valuable resource in its own right and can be ploughed straight back into the agriculture industry. A handy bonus, as the world's phosphorus supplies are diminishing. Once algal biomass has been produced, it needs to be harvested and processed. This is downstream processing. It's where all the biomass from the growing process is concentrated by, for example, filtering and then separated into a range of fractions for direct use or for further purification into high-value products. In algae production, downstream processing is simply taking the algae itself and then turning it into a useful product. So, for example, if it's a very basic product, such as a fish food, it would simply be concentration of the algae itself. But if you want to get into the, the, the meat of the algae, in a sense, uh, it involves the fractionation of algae into multiple products. Some will be high value, which are far more complex to obtain. Some will be lower value, which are more simplistic to obtain. From face creams to medicines, plastics to food, the uses for algae are infinite. So just how economical is it for Northwest Europe to grow algae and harvest it to produce energy and these various products? Data from four years' worth of experiments in growing the different forms of algae has been studied by economists and mathematicians in the UK and the Netherlands who've been working on an algae. These researchers have come up with models to help understand that data, and the conclusions are clear. So can I make money from algae? I think that at the moment um, uh, the cost price is rather high, and that is because um, the whole industry is in its infancy and it still needs to develop further. But the potential is great, but we need to really reduce the cost of production and the cost of processing of algae. And the opportunities are there, but we still have a long way to go. And at the moment, I think the best thing to do is to use algae at high value markets. And those markets are there. So, and those markets will give the algae industry the opportunity to grow slowly to more uh, basic and, uh, uh, well, uh, larger markets. So, the production costs associated with growing algae, particularly for energy, need to decrease dramatically if it is to succeed. So, policymakers now have an opportunity to be more expansive about their thoughts on bioeconomy and algae uh, development. Uh, we've had a focus predominantly on renewable energy um, development in, in Europe. Now we can start thinking about other markets, chemical markets, food ingredients markets, cosmetics, personal care. There's a whole raft of different industrial sectors that algae could um, produce products uh, for. Uh, and if we start to structure our policies in, in that respect, we'll be able to generate more high value jobs and create more value added industries within Europe. Uh, we have discovered that energy is not the only way to go with algae, and though we may have known it before, <laughs> but um, we, we confirm that fact. Whatever the future might hold as far as using algae goes, there's no doubt that this research is happening at an important time for Northwest Europe. A legally binding greenhouse gas reduction target set for 2030 requires the EU to collectively reduce its emissions by at least 40% compared to 1990 levels. The European Council has further endorsed achieving a target of 27% renewable energy and a further 27% or greater improvement in energy efficiency, also to be achieved by 2030. Renewables feature more and more heavily in energy plans. Solar, wind and tidal power are already widely used and some crop-based biofuel, such as bioethanol, is not uncommon. The project itself is coming at a, a nice time when there's a rise again in interest in, in algae generally. That, that means uh, microalgae and macroalgae. And it comes at a time when uh, not only are some of the other technologies uh, reaching their uh, level of, uh, for, for commercialization, um, but they're at a time when there's a need to look at uh, how do all these things fit together. And so it's, a good, it's very, very good timing for algae to be here 
present, active and actually making good progress. So what needs to happen in the future? For example, how can future policy be adapted to help advance the development of algal industries? So policymakers now have the opportunity to think more widely uh, about how they could develop the algal industry. Ultimately we can expand the industries, the industries will gain knowledge, they will learn by, by doing, by operating. Costs ultimately come down through doing that and then there will be a trickle down effect to other lower uh, value markets such as energy and, and all this activity as well produces co-products, by-products, residues from industrial processing. They can always be used uh, to develop energy. It's what we call the cascading principle. So we use um, biomass uh, such as algae to produce high value products uh, initially um, and then use the residues and byproducts from that to um, produce renewable energy later. What about businesses and citizens? How can they empower themselves in the renewables revolution? Help here is at hand from one of the main outputs of the Analgi project. The data on growing algae has been developed into a so-called decision support tool set which will help people understand the underlying economics of algal production. So decision support is really about capturing all of the evidence that we've gathered from across the project. And this evidence can be everything from reports or case studies or raw data. But it can also be simply about tapping into the wealth of knowledge and expertise that we've got within our partnership. It's a web-based tool set. Um, and they can utilise the, the different sets of tools to look at how the process works and what it looks like. Um, we have tools that are aimed at project developers and investors so that they can get a better understanding of the commercial viability of algae for energy. Or they can simply just get access to very credible and scientific data um, through our search engine um, which will enable keyword searches for different reports. It's taken a long time to gather all of this information and data. Um, we're using some really innovative techniques to build the tools. Um, and there's nothing currently that exists that's, that's similar to this, so we're, we're very proud as a project of it. This DST has been demonstrated and used by preview testers with positive initial feedback. So I've been playing with the decision support tool very briefly, but I can already see that the interface is very straightforward and easy to use, easy to navigate the pages, uh, straightforward to find what you're looking for. Uh, and it's very well explained as well. Yeah, it looks like a good idea. I mean, uh, I think depending on the, on the inputs, it, it can be very useful to show, give people an idea, an indication of what kind of productivity and yields they'll be getting when they're growing out, get different attitudes. The same with academics, business people want more, they want real justification and real uh, arguments behind this as a feasible tool. They want to see that it's actually useful and representative. So I think going forward, they could maybe improve that a little bit, but I still think it's a good platform. And what about science? Is there more which science can do with algae to help make our future more sustainable and help Northwest Europe meet its energy needs? And by energy needs, we need not only consider fuel, but also food. But we've been looking at other crops for centuries and we've been growing them and cultivating them and, and optimising them and selecting them so that we get something that we just want. And uh, algae really are a crop of the future. We're only just beginning to explore them. So we know very little um, at the moment about the biochemistry of crops and how we can optimise them for the way that we want. At the moment we all know that it's very healthy to eat oily fish a lot of people don't realise that actually the oils in the fish come from the microalgae that the fish are eating. Now, it may be that some people don't think algae are particularly palatable to eat, but what you can do is take out some of those biosynthetic pathways from the algae and then insert those into a crop that people would be more used to eating. But as regards growing algae purely as a biofuel, the conclusions from an algae are quite clear. The future for algal bar fuels, either there isn't one, uh, we move on and we do other things with the technology we, we've developed, uh, or the future for algal bar fuels rests in a fully integrated biorefinery type of angle. The problem with algal bar fuels in many ways is that the, the, the product which we need for, for bar fuels is, has a particular biochemical composition and that does not align readily with the composition of, of the algae themselves. So that in many ways we are growing an organism which is ideally suited as a food organism for aquaculture, 
or for other activities, but what we need from it for biofuels is a very small proportion. So to optimise the growth for biofuels, we are throwing away a lot of other potential. The use of an integrated approach has potential for, uh, for providing biofuels as a, as a sideline. The question is whether that sideline is really commercially viable in itself. The analysis we've made is that to enhance the biofuel content, you'd be throwing away a lot of other commercially valuable products, specifically uh, biochemicals which could be used in pharmaceuticals, and or for as feedstocks for, for aquaculture, for example. The wonderful thing about science and nature is that we're constantly learning new things about the world and how we can make it a better, healthier and cleaner place to live. The journey which Enalgi has been on has made a huge contribution to that effort. Now it's time to hand over to the next generation of research to take that work forward. Considering the development of most crops has taken thousands of years, We've only been developing algae as a crop and for energy during the last few decades. Just imagine how much progress we can make in the next few decades. NASA is already looking at the possibilities of growing algae in space for future manned space explorations. There's still a lot to learn. For sure, we still need to improve our basic understanding on the metabolism and growth of these hugely diverse groups of macro and micro algae. This will ultimately maximise our chance of getting the most out of them. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to come with us on this voyage of discovery. We hope that you've learned something and we hope you take comfort from the fact that there are people out there working to make the future better. <laughs>